Today, we're going to go through protectionism. It's a very common topic that comes up, especially in paper two and very likely also in paper three, actually. Now, before we start with protectionism, let's start with a very basic definition of what it is. Protectionism is where a country puts up barriers to trade. There are three types of protectionist policies that you need to know. Number one is a tariff. A tariff, very simply, is a tax on imports. Number two is a quota. A quota is an upper limit on the number of units you allow into your economy. So for example, if I put a quota on the number of bananas, let's say 1,000, hypothetically, it means that only 1,000 bananas are allowed to be imported into the UK, nothing above that. And number three is domestic subsidies. Domestic subsidies would give an unfair advantage to your firms domestically over competition around the world. So what we're going to do is simply this. We're going to go through the arguments in favor of protectionism and the arguments against protectionism. That, in essence, is protectionism in a nutshell. Because if you understand these arguments in favor and against, you can mold it around most essays and be able to write some really effective points. So let's start with number one. The first argument in favor of protectionism actually has a name, which is called the infant industry argument. I would always start with this as my first point if I was doing this essay. The infant industry argument is simply this. Particularly in developing countries, domestic firms are too small at this moment in time to tap into the economies of scale that exist in that industry. So hypothetically, let's say that you are a car manufacturer setting up in Zambia. Are you in a position to bulk buy in the same volume and quantity as Mercedes? Probably not. You probably don't have the money and capacity at this moment in time to be able to tap into the vast economies of scale that exist in that industry. So if there was free competition where anyone can come and sell goods in your country, your domestic firms would have no chance of surviving because they have no way of competing on a cost basis. Therefore, the infant industry argument states this. The government should impose protectionist policies in the short run so that they have the time required to tap into the economies of scale, to grow organically, and then once they are ready to compete on an international basis, then you can remove the barriers to trade. So that's number one. Number two. Number two has different names. All of them sound a little bit mean, to be honest, which is to protect either geriatric, senile, sunset, basically dying industries. A good example of that is in the US, the steel industry. It's heavily, heavily protected. And the reason for that is because it's out of date in terms of the fact that it's fallen behind in terms of costs to countries such as China. But the government knows that if they had free trade, this is a major source of employment. So there will be mass levels of unemployment unless they protected them. So number two is to protect industries that are declining or outdated so that you give them the time required to restructure to be able to then be competitive on an international basis. And a good example of that, as I said, is the US steel industry because the Chinese would completely and utterly dominate the manufacturing sector in the US were it not for the heavy protectionism that they have in place. So that's number two. Number three is really straightforward. Number three is if a country has a deficit on its current account, that means that they are importing more than they are exporting. Well, they might want to correct that trade imbalance. How do they do that? Well, if I impose a quota or if I impose a tariff, that would limit the level of imports coming into my economy and therefore I am going to be in a better position in terms of my current account because my imports are going to go down. Those are the three main reasons as to why you might want to argue in favor of protectionism. So let's deal with the arguments against protectionism. Now, would you agree that if I can draw a diagram that shows that the net effect of a tariff is negative, that that could be used as an argument against protectionism? Let's go through that diagram because it is so important that you are able to replicate this in your exam and have a deep understanding of what's happening on this diagram. So it's a really easy diagram to start off with. We simply draw the axes and we have the supply and demand. The only difference now compared to before is that rather than just writing supply and demand, we're gonna do a little subscript, domestic. This is the domestic supply and this is the domestic demand in your economy. 
and we can label the equilibrium, but there isn't really a need here simply because of the fact that we know that this is an open economy where they have trade. Now, one of the assumptions that we can make in the tariff diagram is that firms become price takers because there are so many firms around the world that are selling this particular good that you have to kind of accept that this is the price. So we're gonna set a particular price below the equilibrium. We're gonna draw that and call that world supply. That is your world price one. Now notice that it hits the supply and demand at different points. Let's talk about why. So initially it hits the supply first. Think about why. So Q1 represents the level of domestic supply of this good. The logic behind it is this isn't a particularly attractive price. The price is quite low. So as a farmer or producer of this good, I don't have that much incentive to sell that much of this. So I only sell Q1 units. On the other hand, demand is really high for this good. It's Q2. Because you look at the market and you're like, wow, this is a great price. I want to buy loads of this good. Now, given that domestic firms are only producing Q1 units, but you want Q2 units, where else can I get this good from? Well, I can buy it from the rest of the world. In other words, the difference between Q1 and Q2 represents the level of imports initially coming into your economy. So let's label that. That distance is your imports. Now, the government decides to impose a tariff on this particular market. A tariff, as we know, is like a tax. So what will happen is, is that the world supply will shift upwards. The logic behind it is that those countries or those firms that are now selling their goods in your economy have to pay a tax. So they're going to price that in. Their price is going to now rise to WP2 and the world supply shifts upwards. So we'll label that world supply plus tariff. Again, let's see where it hits the demand curve and where it hits the supply curve. Dot down from the point where it hits the supply curve first. Now we call that Q3. Notice that the amount that is supplied domestically has now gone up. What's the logic behind that? The logic behind that is that at this higher price, as a producer, I have more incentive. I want to sell more of this good because you know what? This price is more attractive to me. On the other hand, the demand domestically goes down to Q4. It's gone down from Q2 to Q4. How comes? Well, consumers can't afford to buy as much of this good. They don't have as much incentive to buy as much. So there's a contraction along the demand curve. Notice that the new level of imports now is Q3, Q4. It is smaller. The level of imports have now gone down. Now, what I always want you to do on this diagram is to label the four sections. We're going to label this area A, the triangle B, the rectangle C, and the other triangle D. Now, bear with me for one moment. In every single economy, there are three players. Consumer, producer, government. If we can identify that the net effect of this tariff overall is negative, that would be a very strong argument against imposing a tariff. So let's start with the consumer. Remind me from theme one what the definition of consumer surplus is. Consumer surplus is the difference between the maximum price the consumer is willing and able to pay for the good and the actual price they pay for the good. So let's try and figure out what happened to consumer surplus. Which curve is the consumer, supply or demand? It's demand. Now, where on the diagram can I represent the maximum price the consumer is willing to pay for the good? If you look at the diagram, the point at which the demand curve hits the price axis, that is the maximum price that you can afford to pay for this particular good. But what do you actually pay? Well, initially we paid WP1. So consumer surplus is the area that is highlighted at the moment. It's the difference between the maximum they're willing to pay, P1, and then where it hits the demand curve. That big, big triangle is the initial consumer surplus. Now let's look at what happens to consumer surplus when they impose the tariff. Well, the maximum price they're willing to pay hasn't changed because there's no shift in demand. But what has changed? What's changed now is the actual price they pay for the good. It is now WP2. So the new surplus is from where the demand curve hits the axis to WP2 to the demand curve. Can you see how much the consumer surplus has gone down by? Consumer surplus has gone down by A, B, C, and D. The consumer gets absolutely walloped in a protectionist diagram. So you would write consumer surplus equals minus A, minus B, minus C, minus D. 
Not good times for the consumer. Second player, player two is the producer. So let's remind ourselves of what producer surplus is. Producer surplus is the difference between the minimum price they're willing and able to sell the good and the actual price they sell the good for. So we look at the supply curve now. Where does the supply curve hit the axes? That represents the lowest price they're willing to sell for the good. What was the price initially? The initial price was WP1. So from that point until it hits WP1, until it hits the supply curve, that little triangle is the initial producer surplus. Now, when the government imposes the tariff, there's no change in the minimum price the supplier is willing to sell the good for, so it's still operating at the same point. But what has changed is the price they actually get for the good. It is now WP2. So the surplus, if you look at it now, is the starting point where the supply hits the price axis, WP2, and then where it hits the supply curve. It has gone up. It's gone up by plus A. So we've got consumer, minus A, minus B, minus C, minus D, but the producer benefits, it's plus A. The final player in any economy is the government. And what happens to the government? Well, the government collects revenue whenever they impose a tax. And think about the two things that I need to know in order to calculate how much revenue the government's collecting. Number one, the first thing that I need to know is how much they're taxing per unit. In other words, what is the tariff? Well, I already know that because it's the difference between my old world supply and the new world supply. That distance represents how much they're taxing per unit. The second thing that I need to know is how many units are now being imported for them to tax. They can only tax what comes into the economy. Do we know the new level of imports? Yes. The new level of imports is the width Q3 to Q4. Therefore, the area C represents the gain for the government. The government collects tax revenue equivalent to C. So, to summarize, what we've we got so far. Consumer, minus A, minus B, minus C, minus D. Producer, plus A. Government, plus C. Really basic maths. The net effect is simply this. The two A's cancel each other out. The two C's cancel each other out. What you're left with then is minus B and minus D. You are left with two welfare loss triangles. In other words, the net effect of a tariff is negative. And there are two key reasons why you are left with these welfare loss triangles, by the way. The first is that consumers now face a higher price and they have less choice. The second is that inefficient domestic firms that wouldn't have survived under free trade are now kept in the market. Therefore, allocative efficiency goes down. Consumer welfare has clearly gone down because not only do they face a higher price and have less choice, the quality of the goods they're now getting might be lower as well. That is your go-to first point when you're arguing against the tariff. And it's a very effective way of going through it. So that's number one. Number two, the second bad thing about imposing a tariff or any form of protectionism is that it could trigger a trade war. One of our analysis points was to say, hey, look, I can reduce my trade deficit by imposing a tariff, okay? But what if the other country does exactly the same thing to you? That means the level of exports leaving your economy will be going down. And in particular, if the demand for your exports are elastic, whereas the demand for your imports are inelastic, then you're in trouble because your current account isn't gonna get better, it's gonna get worse. So if people don't really care about the goods that you sell around the world, but your consumers buy a lot of goods from the rest of the world, then you imposing a tariff and it causing a trade war, retaliation, is really bad news for you because it will do the exact opposite of what you're trying to achieve by imposing that tariff. Number three, the last point is simply this, is that by imposing any form of protectionism, it distorts comparative advantage which is a really important concept in theme four. One of the key assumptions for comparative advantage to be taking place is that there's free trade between countries. The moment you start to impose protectionist policies, that distorts comparative advantage, and as a result, there is an inefficient allocation of global resources, everyone's worse off. Living standards as a whole decline due to protectionist policies. And that is how you write a really effective essay on protectionism. Hope that was helpful. Please subscribe and check out some of our videos as well. Thank you for watching.
Why not subscribe to our platform to see other videos like this one? You can also register to attend intensive revision courses, book a private tutor, and utilize our in-house revision resources to help you achieve top grades. Good luck.